All right, so um, I am uh, showing here, this is my iPad screen being kind of projected into a window on my uh, desktop so I can share it over Zoom. Um, everybody can see this okay? Yes. Great. Um, so uh, Wolfram Player, uh, let's go and look at this notebook. Um, some of the, the bits of this I kind of took from a, the last talk I gave at the tech conference uh, a few years ago. Um, most of it is still relevant. And then I have added some sections that kind of might be more interesting to um, people who you know, do work in the kernel um, uh, as far as some of those things are, are relevant for iOS. Um, so this is the player app um, and um, this is just a regular slideshow notebook uh, that I opened uh, directly from my Wolfram Cloud account. Um, I can also store notebooks locally um, and uh, view them like so. Um, uh, we can see the notebook content. You know, we have 3D graphics. I can touch them and rotate them. Um, one of the, the neat features we have on iOS is uh, with the 3D graphic, I can just take it and spin it and uh, it will keep going for a little bit and eventually come to a stop. Uh, we can uh, use manipulates. This is a manipulate right here. It looks a little bit different on iOS um, because uh, you know the default control placement for manipulate on a desktop system is kind of right above the content. And if you try to interact with your fingers uh, with uh, controls above your content, your hand is gonna be blocking the content itself. So uh, what we do on iOS is that we hide the controls by default. And then there is this little um, uh, control button down here. We can tap on that and we get some controls at the bottom of the screen. So uh, when we interact with it, our hand isn't blocking uh, the content that we're actually interested in. Um, and I can move these things around here and I can still rotate it and I can actually um, use one finger to move the controls while using a different finger to rotate the graphic. Um, and so uh, these things are, you know, just normal controls. This is a locator, uh, which looks a little bit different on iOS because when I touch the locator, I can no longer see, you know, where it's going to go. So we have this little magnifying glass pop up that's kind of similar to the text editing magnifying glass you get on iOS. Uh, so if I go back to my presentation here, uh, the app notices that it's a presentation and it automatically goes into slideshow mode. Um, and I can just swipe to the next screen to get to the next slide. Uh, so this app was released uh, to the public in the iOS App Store five years ago. Um, anyone can go there and get it now. Uh, so this works uh, both on iPads and iPhones uh, running iOS or iPad OS 14, 15, or 16. Uh, the currently released version is 13.1, same as desktop. Uh, it uses uh, the same version of the kernel uh, that the desktop uses. Uh, the free version of the app that you just download and get for free uh, will display arbitrary notebooks. It allows you to view dynamic content. Uh, so if you have a dynamic box or a manipulate uh, it will appear on screen and it will render correctly. Um, and you can, you know, rotate 3D graphics in the free version. So there is an upgrade to the free version that will enable full dynamic interactivity. Um, one way to do this is to just use an in-app purchase, which is currently $10. Um, if you are a Wolfram Cloud subscriber, uh, you can just log into your Wolfram Cloud account and you will get that for free. Or um, if you have a signed, an enterprise signed notebook, you can distribute that and people can interact with it for free um, because it was uh, signed from some sort of enterprise account. And this was long enough ago that I don't know if the marketing term is still enterprise CDF for this. It might be something different at this point. Um, uh, but those signed notebooks uh, will still work. So, um, you can open documents anywhere from anywhere using this app. Uh, if you are logged into Wolfram Cloud account, you can open uh, notebooks from your Wolfram Cloud account. You can log into multiple cloud accounts at the same time. You can receive 
email attachments and open them up. You can uh, download from the web. Um, so if I just go to, this is a random uh, Wolfram demonstration. I can just download this file, download, and uh, there's kind of an extra step on iOS because it gives you this useless preview at first. So you just have to choose to open it in the Wolfram player app. Um, and then, you know, we get our demonstration and we can do all of the, oh, and we just found a bug. We can do all of the demonstration stuff. Um, um, there are other, you can use other cloud services that integrate with the files app. You can just open anything from the files app uh, and it will open in player. You can sync files manually uh, with iTunes, or I guess now this is with the finder. Uh, this is a really obscure way to do things and um, uh, difficult to describe. So probably <laughs> uh, just using one of the cloud methods is, is gonna be much easier. Uh, so the, the full kernel is embedded. It does all computations locally. It's not doing uh, anything network-based. It's not talking to the cloud servers. Uh, to run the manipulates or to uh, view the dynamic content. Um, so this will work completely offline. And there's uh, some things that we do that are specific to this platform uh, to make the user experience just a little bit better. Uh, things like buttons and sliders are larger relative to the other notebook content than they are on a desktop system since uh, we're using, uh, you know, a, we need the touch targets to be finger sized rather than mouse pointer sized. Um, we have uh, pinch to zoom, which works really nicely. Uh, you can just zoom into any part of a notebook and uh, scroll around. Everything um, re-renders at a higher resolution, looks really nice. Um, and as I mentioned before, the default position for manipulate controls doesn't uh, require you to cover the content with your hand as you're interacting with it. So there are some limitations and um, uh, these are becoming fewer and fewer as time goes on. Uh, but uh, so one of the main limitations, this is a player app. Uh, so it does not allow you to edit content. You can't create notebooks, edit notebooks, save notebooks. Uh, you can just view them and interact with them. Um, if you are on an iOS device and you have a you know, a need to edit documents, we have the Wolfram Cloud app that will allow you to do that. Um, so there are some incomplete features. This was kind of a, uh, there's some of these things are, you know, caused by platform limitations and some are caused by uh, the fact that this is just kind of a newer product that we haven't been working on continuously since 1988. Um, so some of the things that are not currently implemented are things like event handler. Uh, we do support locator inside of manipulate, but not outside of manipulate. Input field has some limitations in that uh, it just accepts plain text. You can't do typesetting in input field. Um, JLink is a you know, kernel technology that is not available for iOS and will never be available for iOS um, just because it you know, relies on the Java virtual machine, which uh, doesn't run on iOS. Uh, database link is not available. And I think this is mostly because of the JLink limitation. Uh, some of the newer front end features like surface appearance are not yet implemented in the iOS version. Access box is another example uh, of something that is not uh, implemented for iOS. And um, one of the things that's different about the iOS uh, product versus the desktop product is that uh, the kernel and the user interface are running within the same process on iOS. Um, so you can't quit the kernel and restart it and get a fresh fresh session. Um, the kernel is part of the same same app. So you'd have to, to kill the entire app if you wanted to uh, quit the kernel for some reason. Uh, I, I think there has been some work done by the kernel team to enable a features like this. It's not something that we have um, hooked up yet or done any testing with. So um, it's just not available at this point. 
So performance used to be a, a major concern uh, with iOS devices. Um, you know, the first iPad had a, a very slow processor. I think it was double, I think it was a dual core, uh, but still very slow um, and had 128 megabytes of RAM. Um, and so these were big problems that we had to work around. Um, and these are the sorts of things that are going away. Um, the current, uh, my iPad that I'm running this on uh, has an Apple M2 processor with eight cores. And if I compare that to a high-end Windows desktop that I have from this year using Intel's fastest Core i9 processor, um, the performance scores are pretty similar. Um, my, the iPad has slightly better single core performance, slightly worse multi-core performance. Um, although it's actually pretty close if you take into consideration that this has half as many cores as my high-end Windows desktop does. It's almost, uh, you know, it's just 20% lower multi-core performance. Uh, memory is still a little bit of a concern. Um, you can get an iPad Pro with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Most iPads do not have that much RAM. Um, so maybe four gigabytes to two to four gigabytes is more common. Um, prior to iOS 16, there was absolutely no swap space. Uh, so when your apps used a lot of memory, the OS would just kill it. Um, and, uh, you know, it would go back to, you know, the main springboard uh, user interface uh, and you'd have to start your app back up. Um, so we now do have swap space. Uh, we have more memory on you know, more recent machines, uh, but this is still kind of a problem. And if we still use too much memory, the OS will still kill the app. So the Wolfram engine that is embedded into this app, um, as I mentioned before, it's running in the same process. It's running on a background thread. It uses the same MathLink communication uh, that external processes use to communicate with the user interface. Um, so there's not much about the kernel that is actually different um, than it is on a desktop uh, OS. Um, there is a different MathLink device that's being used. It's called the IntraProcess device. This is the only platform that uses it. I don't know really any details about it other than it's simply just something that was optimized for you know, two ends of the link uh, to be talking to each other within the same process. Uh, so library link is something that is a little bit different on iOS. Um, library link builds, you know, dynamic libraries that can be loaded into the engine at the Wolfram engine at runtime. iOS has, you know, serious security restrictions that uh, limits some of these things. And so anything that is loaded into the app at runtime has to be built into a framework and has to be cryptographic, cryptographically signed before we distribute it on the app store. Uh, which means that we have to do some extra work for every library link module we want to include. Um, and because it requires extra work, uh, we haven't had anyone just go through and update every library link module uh, that the, the company has has made. Uh, we have basically done them as needed. Um, and, you know, when somebody requests a specific bit of functionality, then we, you know, go through and do the extra work uh, required. There's uh, some build updates. There's some RE updates uh, for the signing and copying the right files to the right places. Um, so it's a little bit of a hassle, but these modules do work. Um, and, you know, the big one was various network connectivity uh, that just didn't exist at first uh, for iOS until uh, we got a lot of this stuff up and running. And so now, you know, we do have network. Uh, I think this is the, this is the curl link. Um, and so uh, this, this screen is just showing a list of the, the framework, the uh, library link modules that have been ported to iOS and are being distributed. Um, and if anybody has need for others, we can add others to this list. 
So link snooper is something that exists on desktop. Um, and for uh, people you know, in the front end group in particular, this is something we use frequently um, as we're you know, dealing with dynamic uh, content, seeing what actually uh, the content that actually travels between um, the expressions that travel between the user interface and the kernel is pretty important. Uh, so we do have uh, something like this in, on iOS. It's not exactly the same. Uh, you know, actual link snooper on desktop machines is built using JLink, uh, and it's a separate process. And those are things that we can't accommodate on iOS. Uh, so we have something built into the product. It's only available in debug builds, uh, but there's a little settings screen you can go to enable it. And then um, when you're running in Xcode, for example, there is a um, you know a console that shows the output of all of uh, the expressions that go back and forth. So uh, dynamic content. Um, it's implemented in iOS much the same as it is in the desktop front end. Uh, dynamics that are on screen will update uh, whenever they need to. When they're off screen, they don't update at all. Uh, so this is um, to optimize things uh, so that we're not constantly doing dynamic evaluations for content that will never be seen. Uh, one other major difference uh, for dynamic, there's lots of uh, what what we in the front end group call front end evaluator functions. These are things that are uh, that look like uh, Wolfram language functions, but they're implemented in the front end. And uh, there are many of these in the front end backtick or FE private backtick contexts that are not available on iOS, uh, just because there are literally hundreds of them uh, to do lots of different stuff. And we haven't had time to implement all of them yet. So. A lot of the more common ones are implemented. Uh, some of the more obscure ones are not. And um, this is just kind of to illustrate uh, the manipulate differences that I have mentioned before. Uh, so this is just a screenshot of manipulate on a, uh, on a desktop version of Mathematica. Uh, we get the controls there at the top. Um, and you can imagine uh, putting your hand up there to move one of these sliders, you wouldn't be able to see the content. And so, um, you know, I showed this example earlier, but this is what we get on um, on iOS. Controls are kind of more out of the way, easier to to deal with. And so, let me exit my. Slideshow, I'll go back here. Um, and I showed opening the file from uh, the dem demonstration. Okay. So um, I really sped through that. Uh, there may be people who have some questions. Um, basically, yeah, I mean, the, the key points to take away about uh, this app, um, there are you know, many similarities to the desktop app, but some you know, key differences. Uh, it's a player only app. Um, there are some unimplemented features from the desktop front end that aren't yet here. And there are some uh, limitations with things like uh, JLink and library link uh, that need to be uh, thought about if you're if you want to um, you know distribute some you know some serious uh, demonstration like things or some serious uh, you know enterprise like CDF uh, content using uh, this app for mobile devices. Uh, 